Welcome back to the Culture Blast podcast, a series of deep dive interviews with personalities from across the world of culture. I'm Farah Nayeri, and I'm a journalist and author based in London. My book, Takedown, Art and Power in the Digital Age, comes out in January, and it's available for purchase online. In the first three episodes, I had the pleasure of interviewing Emma Thompson, the Oscar-winning actor and writer, Niall Rogers, the Grammy Award-winning composer, producer, and guitarist, and Nan Golden, the celebrated photographer and activist. If you haven't heard those episodes, do tune in. I now bring you the very first author in the series, Elif Shafak, the novelist, essayist, and Booker Prize nominee. Elif, who is British-Turkish, has published 19 books, 12 of them novels, and her two TED Talks have had a combined 8.5 million views. Of her latest novel, The Island of Missing Trees, the historian Mary Beard said, I never imagined enjoying a book in which one of the main characters is a tree, but it has worked for me. Elif Shafak, I'm delighted to welcome you as the very first author on Culture Blast. You're my fourth guest after Emma Thompson, Niall Rogers, and Nan Golden. And it's truly wonderful to have you on this show. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Um, you're also, importantly, my very first guest from the East. You're originally from Turkey, which is next door to where I'm from originally, Iran. So this podcast is also a window on that part of the world. Um, the pandemic is maybe a boring and slightly predictable place to start this conversation, but it's kind of also an inevitable question, an inevitable place to start. I wondered, at the beginning of the pandemic, Elif, publishers were tweeting that the isolation wasn't really very different for authors because they were solitary creatures anyway. And, you know, they were always cooped up at home. So what difference did it make? And you objected to that. I, I wanted to know why. Oh, indeed. I, with, with good intentions, of course, several publishers have been tweeting out uh, or, or sharing these messages saying perhaps it was not going to be as big of a difference for authors, uh, particularly for novelists, because we are such solitary creatures, you know, for weeks, for months, we live in, inside our own imagination. But my experience wasn't like that at all. And I think the pandemic affected all of us. It's, it's an existential, you know, um, moment in the sense that there's a lot of rethinking we need to do right now. We're almost at a crossroads, both as individuals and as societies, communities. So you find yourself asking, is this the book that I should be working on right now? Is this the kind of story that I should be chasing right now? Does it really matter, you know, whether I find the perfect synonym, whether I move that comma from this sentence to the next, when so much is happening outside the window, when people are dying in their thousands, when there's so much, you know, uncertainty. So it affects all of us. And I found myself doing some, you know, serious thinking. I had to stop what I was doing. And I wrote a little manifesto called How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division, which helped me in a way to deal with all these negative emotions from anxiety to fear, from uncertainty to anger um, that is present inside our lives. And, and writing that manifesto, I think, was my way of responding to this moment in time. And do you think that that novel or your fiction in general have, have been affected by the pandemic, that, that your stories will take a different trajectory? I think that definitely literature has been affected because we don't live outside this moment as writers. You know, we are all the children of our own age. Um, and it's good that we feel that connection, especially as artists. You know, that's, that's what art is all about. You're not disconnected. You're not desensitized, just the opposite. You are very much tuned. It doesn't mean you have to write books that are about the pandemic. The effect can take all kinds of ways. But for me personally, and I've seen this in, in my recent novel, uh, it brought me much closer to nature. You know, I'm a tree hugger. I love trees. I've been reading 
reading, thinking about trees, researching about trees for a long time, but it pushed me more gently in that direction. I think it is a moment of reckoning. It's a crossroads in which we have to urgently reconnect with nature, understand that we're destroying our only home, uh, this planet, but also connect with each other as human beings. And the third reconnection that I think we need to urgently achieve is connect with ourselves, connect within, you know, the inner garden, build an inner garden. So it is a moment in which we cannot be disconnected. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a line in your latest novel and you write, pain, there was so much pain everywhere and in everyone. The only difference was between those who managed to hide it and those who no longer could. And I guess that really is a reply to this tweet from publishers saying, oh, well, authors are always cooped up at home and solitary and, you know, the pandemic won't really make a difference to them. Uh, it will, because obviously as, as an author, you have to be empathetic. You have to be tuned in to other people's pain and suffering. I mean, that's what it means to be an author, no? Absolutely. And also you're dealing, like everyone else, with lots of, you know, anxiety, sometimes depression, mental health issues. I think we need to talk about mental health, you know, and there's a horrible narrative about mental health, which situates it as a side issue, as if something, as if it's something that happens only to some people, you know, quote unquote losers, they call. Um, all of that narrative is, is horrible and, and we need to, um, dismantle it. And we need to understand that at a moment like this, actually so many of us, if not all of us, we are dealing with lots of negative emotions, whether it's anxiety or fear or disappointment or frustration or fatigue, sometimes an emotional fatigue. And it's okay. It is understandable because we are all human. It also shows that we are responding, you know, so, Ili, if your new novel, The Island of Missing Trees, is a story that is set between Cyprus and Britain and at various points in historical time, I have two words to describe it, charming and enchanting. It's a bit like a fable, and it catapulted me back to my Persian childhood and the stories I used to be told back then. And of course, the American actor Reese Witherspoon has chosen it as her November pick for the Reese's Book Club. So, you know, you're getting many, many readers for this book already. And it's been, as we know, nominated for the Costa Book Prize, formerly known as the Whitbread Book Award. The book is a delightful fusion of East and West, like the island of Cyprus, like your homeland, Turkey, and like you, Elif. One of its principal protagonists is a fig tree that silently and wisely observes the goings-on around it. The tree sometimes makes very astute pronouncements, such as, quote, Family traumas are like thick, translucent resin dripping from a cut in the bark. They trickle down generations. When I was reading the very first pages of this book, I wondered about this recurrent voice in the book. I wondered if this fig tree maybe wasn't something of a literary contrivance. Maybe it was a bit awkward. Maybe it was repetitive. But then I quickly realized the book would not be the same without it. And it would be a lesser book. That this fig tree is an absolutely essential component of your book. It is an absolutely essential figure in this book. Just as Flaubert famously said, Madame Bovary, c'est moi. It just seems to me that this fig tree is you. And how did you come up with this fig tree as a narrative voice? I, I really appreciate um, your words so much. What does it mean to be rooted, uprooted, almost deracinated, you know, rootless? So uh, th these are issues that I care about a lot. But also I've been primarily I've been wanting to write about Cyprus for a very long time. And there's no doubt in my mind that this is a beautiful island, you know, beautiful people north and south. It's enchanting, but at the same time, it's a very difficult story to tell. And that's precisely because the past is not a bygone affair in Cyprus. You know, it's an open wound. And there are clashing memories and there's accumulated grief and hurt and lots of silences. It's also quite remarkable that here in the UK, not many people know much about the history of Cyprus, even though the history of Cyprus is also part of British history, right? Even though so many tourists go there every year from all over Europe, it's one of the top destinations for European tourists. 
So that was interesting too. But basically, I've been trying to approach this um, story in my mind, reading, researching, listening to people, especially immigrants in the diaspora, without being able to find a gate, a door, an opening into the story until I found the fig tree. So this might sound very awkward, but I feel very grateful, very thankful to this fig tree, which gave me a completely different perspective. The, and it also allowed me to think beyond tribalism, beyond nationalism, because that was the main thing. You know, how do you tell the story of an island or of a land that has experienced division, war, partition, ethnic violence without yourself falling into the trap of nationalism as a storyteller? Finding the voice or the perspective of a fig tree allowed me um, to find a completely different angle. Trees, of course, live longer than us. They were here before us. They will probably be around once we have all disappeared as human beings. So that longer, you know, perspective uh, was was important. We human beings tend to forget very easily. So let's talk a little bit about your family background. You were born in uh, Strasbourg, France, where your father was getting his PhD at the time. And you grew up in the 1970s as a little girl in an apartment where emigres came and went they were chatting about philosophy and they were chain smoking gouloise. Can you take us back to that apartment and to your very first memories as a little girl? Thank you. So yes, this was Strasbourg, um, and it was a time of, you know, students, student movements, uh, a time of social change. Um, and I, of course, the, the, the memories that I share with you, th these are the, like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, these are the pieces that I brought together much later in life because I was very young when I, when I left France. But that house that I first uh, was brought into is in my mind always, you know, associated with tobacco smoke, lots of books, um, students and immigrants talking passionately about revolution, reading uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, but not so much Simone de Beauvoir, uh, reading Althusser, you know, and, and, and yes, talking about change. Uh, when my parents got separated after a while, my father stayed in France and he got married again. And then uh, in the meantime, my mother brought me to Turkey, to Ankara. Yeah, I, I, I was going to, I am going to get to that. Your parents separated, you and your mother moved back to Turkey and your father, I believe, remarried and had two other children. And I just wanted to know, how did your parents' separation sort of make you feel? Yes, I think it, rather than the, the fact that they got separated, because from an early age onwards, uh, I thought that, you know, divorce happened, it could happen. It was as, in a way, normal as marriage itself. So I didn't experience that as, as a trauma. However, the fact that my father had no connection with me was very hard to swallow. So it was that part, you know, that I couldn't make sense of for a very long time. As you said, um, he got married again and my two brothers, they're half Turkish, half French, you know, and it took me many years. First of all, I haven't met my brothers for, for a long time. I've met them in my mid twenties. Uh, that was, uh, you know, that, that was, I think, sad. It, it didn't have to be that way. You know, yeah. we could have met earlier. Yeah. We could have been spending time together. I, I wish it could have been that way. So, but my point is there were lots of absences. I think I've experienced an absence of love vis-a-vis -vis my father mm -hmm. and the very strong presence of love vis-a-vis -vis my mother and my grandmother. Yes. So I've experienced these two sides. You have. And, and you use the word anger in the past about this. Uh, situation that you said that you you experienced anger for a long time, but now you don't seem angry to me. I think it seems like maybe it has been overcome. Yes, I mean, there are always traces of anger. And of course, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, anger is understandable too. Personally, what I was trying to understand was, you know, how come he had made no contact? How come it was such, you know, a big disconnect for him and this didn't trouble him? But also there was something more difficult for me to understand or digest. You know, had he been a bad human being, it would have been easier for me to digest that big gap or void between us. 
But as I figured out over the years, he was a very good father to his sons. He was a very good husband, you know, to his wife. Also, he was a very good professor, very much beloved by his students. And he was a good, he was a good citizen. So that troubled me, you know, that someone is so um, good and positive and constructive in many other facets of his life. But then how can he be so dismissive in, in another part of his life? And the reason why I mentioned this is because as novelists, this is what we do. We try to unpack those layers upon layers. And as human beings, of course, we're all very complicated. We are very complex. To be able to understand and process that took me a while. And once I'd done that, the anger was much, much, much less for me. I'm not saying I've overcome my anger completely, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't shape me or dominate me anymore. And I mean, it's, it's, these are universal realities. I think all your readers will have their own pain, their own trauma. And the fact that you transform yours into uh, material for a novel Brings a lot of solace. Thank you. Let's let's go to Ankara from Strasbourg. I mean, we're kind of traveling the world here. So you moved to Ankara from Strasbourg. You lived in the house of this extraordinary grandmother of yours in this traditional and conservative, quite Muslim neighborhood of the Turkish capital. Your grandmother was a healer, someone people came to for potions and cures. And her house had evil eye beads all over the walls. Can you take us to her house now? Take us to Ankara and to this home. Yes, I mean, this house, this green house, um, two-story, um, with a garden, you know, fruit trees, cherry trees in the garden. It was co- so different than the, you know, the, the banlieues in, in Strasbourg, um, that environment. I also need to tell you that when my mother brought me back to Turkey, because of course, for her, Turkey was motherland. For me, it was a completely new country. Yeah. She had um, no diploma because she had dropped out of university when she got married, thinking yeah. love would be enough. Love was all he- she needed. So by the time she got um, divorced, she had no money, no career, no diploma, nothing to fall back on. I am going to ask you about that as my next question, <laughs> yeah. but because your mother's education is very important, a transformative aspect of your life, too. Uh, but I just wanted to s- stay with your grandmother for a minute sure, and sure. stay in that house. And can you tell me as a little girl, what was it like? Who, who were these people coming and going? I mean, there were women in there waxing their legs. There was salt thrown on the floor, scattered all over the house. Your grandma was melting lead. Tell me what, why, why the melting lead? Yes, so this is the woman who raised me until I was um, ten years old. You know, I stayed with Grandma, and she played a big role in my in my life. Um, she wasn't very well educated because she had been denied a proper education for being a girl, and yet she wholeheartedly believed in women's education. And she also taught me that there are different paths to knowledge. I am someone who has dedicated her life to books and literature, and I, I, I adore knowledge. You know, I love research, learning. However, thanks to my grandmother, I have found out, I have learned that there are different paths to wisdom. You know, there are people like her who don't have a proper diploma and who are very wise. There are people who have graduated from very, you know, glamorous schools or big name places who are very ignorant as well. So she taught me a completely different way of approaching knowledge and wisdom. And mostly it was based on oral culture, oral mm-hmm. storytelling. She was a bit of a storyteller herself, oral storyteller, and a bit of a healer. And people would come to her, people complaining about, um, you know, some mental health issues, skin diseases. So I grew up observing her, you know, melting leads, reading coffee cups, uh, just, you know, s- sprinkling salt everywhere. It, it was a very irrational world. It was a very dynamic, colorful world full of stories, legends, myths, superstitions, riddles, folklore. And there's a part of me that respects that world. I've never looked down upon that world. So I would love my writing to the best of my ability to bridge written culture and oral culture. Oh, it absolutely does. Before I move on, the melted lead, what was that for? 
that is toward of the evil eye and it's um okay. it's an ancient technique so they they basically interpret the shapes that appear on melted lead they they pour it in a cup in a into a bowl full of water and that sizzling sound you hear and then they interpret the shapes that appear you know this grandmother of yours was you know an extraordinary woman she was a feminist i i mean it's very clear who completely changed your life and that of your mother. Because as you were saying before I interrupted you, she was prevented from getting an education and she was adamant that your divorced mother continue her education. So your mother went to university, uh, studied, uh, passed with flying colors and became a diplomat. Yes, yes, indeed. Later on, she became a diplomat. But had grandma not intervened, I think that wouldn't have been possible because a young divorcee in such a conservative setting is uh, immediately married off to usually to someone older you know she's not very favorable in the marital market anymore and that's what people were trying to do um had my grandmother not intervened and she said no you go back to college you go back to university graduate you know have a diploma have a career have choices you can always get married again if you want to it will be a choice it won't be an obligation and until the day you're ready I'll take care of my granddaughter. And this is what these two women did. So what stayed with me from all those experiences, what stayed very vividly is what I call sisterhood, you know, the solidarity. They did support each other at a moment that was very delicate. You know, it could go either way. Mm -hmm. And because they supported, because there was this uh, solidarity, the impact of that kind of solidarity between women uh, when and if achieved, I think it goes beyond generations. It changed not only my mother's life, but my life and probably my children's lives as well. So I'm a big believer in women supporting women. Absolutely. And, and I think it seems to me that these two women, your wise, devout and superstitious grandma and your educated, westernized and very rational mother. I mean, they're the two sides of you, are they not? That is so true, actually. And maybe they're the two sides of my writing as well. Um, I stayed in academia for long years. I've done mostly interdisciplinary research studies and I love it. Uh, and I, and I enjoy it. But on the other hand, as you said, there's another world out there full of legends, myths, whatever you call it, spirituality, superstitions that I am also tuned into or I'm aware of um, and, and I think you can connect these two worlds because that's how it is for us especially the region where we come from you and I come from this is how life is you know I mean, I have to say, confess to you that I have uh, moments where I get very, very superstitious. And I mean, I really do have a lot of superstitions. And I have a mother who tells me, you know, you you got all this education. I mean, what are these beliefs that you have? These superstitions are for people who maybe have, you know, less of an education. And I say, I can't help it. And and I wondered how, how you, you know, respond. Do you have these superstitions that you carry with you? as someone who's from Turkey and is the granddaughter of that lady? Well, sometimes I do. Like you, I catch myself doing things that I, you know, think I wouldn't do. Um, but joking aside, I do make a distinction between, you know, all these superstitions that we're talking about and religiosity. I think they're completely different things. And actually in the island of missing trees, I was very interested in the superstitions that are shared by Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. And there's a moment in the book in which it says, while religions clashed and nationalisms preached superiority, superstitions actually got along pretty well. Because, you know, you will see a Greek Cypriot grandmother or a Turkish Cypriot grandmother spitting in the air to ward off the evil eye. It is those things that I want to focus on, the things that travel beyond borders, across partition lines. And in that regard, there is something about superstitions that connects us. So whether you're talking to an Irish grandmother or a Turkish grandmother or a Persian grandmother, they know, you know, what we're talking about and, and they share. Uh, maybe sometimes superstitions are the 
reflection of our deepest fears. There's something very human in their existence. So rather than looking down upon that world, I try to understand that world. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that I lived in Rome for uh, more than three years and uh, the number of superstitions that the Romans and Italians have that are absolutely identical to the ones we have in Iran is just yeah. sort of countless, actually. <laughs> um, and so uh, your mother's... Um, diplomatic career led you to live in Spain. You lived in Spain uh, as a as a young girl and then then you moved on. You you later lived and worked in Massachusetts and Michigan and Arizona and then you moved back to Turkey. You're now living and working in London. And you point out that as human beings we have multiple identities that we don't just fit into one box with one neat label. And of course in your regard that's absolutely true. And yet, even with this nomadic life that you'd, you've led and the many long years spent living outside your country, your identity is still very much bound up with Turkey. You know, you say Turkey is very much confused about its identity. It's torn between East and West. Perhaps the same could be said of you. I mean, how successfully do you think you navigate the belonging to these two very, very different worlds? That's a beautiful question. It's a tough question. Yeah. You know, I um, was educated in Turkey. Of course, I lived in in Spain. There were times I was in Jordan back and forth. But most of my upbringing was in Turkey. And in my early 20s, I moved to Istanbul. I fell in love with Istanbul. And I still consider myself an Istanbulite. You know, uh, it's very visible in my writing, my love for the city, my longing for the city. And I think we don't leave the places we love just because we we happen to be away from them. You know, even when we're miles and continents away from them, we continue to carry them with us. Uh, so Istanbul keeps coming with me. And I am Turkish, of course. I'm very attached to the culture, particularly, you know, as we mentioned, oral culture, women, youth, minorities, food, music. You know, there are all these things that you think are very um, insignificant details until it hits you hard, like the smell of roasted chestnuts or the taste of a sesame bagel, you know, uh, they trigger bigger memories. So there's an emotional connection with Turkey that will always be with me and also with the Turkish language, of course, as a writer. However, I'm also someone who believes in multiple belongings, as you mentioned. Uh, I feel attached to the Balkans. I have elements in my soul from the Middle East. I do consider myself European. I have become a Londoner over the years. I do feel very attached to London and I have become a British citizen uh, again over the years. And despite what politicians have been telling us here in the UK because of this Brexit saga, I want to call myself a citizen of the world. That doesn't mean that you're floating in the air, you know, aimlessly. Uh, it, it means that you can have multiple, you know, attachments. Then sometimes people say, well, you can say that if you have been living a more nomadic life. Um, that's as if that's a privilege. Uh, I disagree. I think as human beings, we all have multiple belongings. We all contain multitudes, like Walt Whitman used to say, even if you were born and raised in one town, you know, got married in the same town, had your own kids in the same town, let's say, you still have multitudes inside, whether it's your sexual identity, political affiliations, the stories of your ancestors, the inherited pain that you carry that might not be visible at first glance, etc., etc. So we're all complex. The problem is we're living in a world that doesn't allow us to bring out that complexity, let alone celebrate it. Very well said. Um, in his memoir, Joseph Anton, Salman Rushdie wrote that when he was a young writer, he felt that there was something wrong and something misconceived about him, and he realized what it was. He was a migrant, um, one of those who had ended up in a place that was not the place where he began. And he wrote that migration tore up all the traditional roots of the self, place, community, culture, and language. Um, I was very, very struck and moved by this particular passage and very kind of mystified by it because I just don't understand what it is about the motherland that makes it so difficult for us to tear away from. I mean, even if you'd lived in Las Vegas all your life, Elif, it would still be Turkey that would beckon, you know, that would, that would pull at you, that, that would kind of define you that would have, you know, be the biggest component of a, your identity. And I just don't really quite understand that. Can you have an, do you have an explanation? 
That's that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, it's language, it's upbringing, it's, you know, the stories you grow up with. Uh, it's something very emotional. For me, though, at the end of the day, I think my motherland is storyland. Mm. And because the earlier stories that shaped me took place in Turkey, I associate that storyland mostly with Turkey. It doesn't make sense, you know, with my grandmother's house and all these oral cultures that we mentioned. But at the end of the day, motherland is storyland. Mm. I see. I, I, you know, one great characteristic of your motherland and mine is that sex is a major taboo, especially where women are concerned. Women are expected to be chaste and virginal even after they're married, you know, even, even as adults somehow. And, and when we met for coffee last week here in London, you said something about how in Turkey, uh, certain men liken women to a particular vegetable. Can I get you to repeat that analogy? Oh, that's an awful, awful analogy. But unfortunately, they keep using it and it makes me so angry. Um, so basically, they say uh, in order to... Um, explain why women should be modest and they should cover themselves. They keep saying that women are like tomatoes. And if you go to a supermarket, uh, would you like to buy you know, tomatoes that have no package, you know, no plastic covering that ha that have been touched by other hands? Or would you like to buy the tomatoes that are pure and covered with plastic and clearly untouched? So that kind of metaphor. And of course, this is what we're dealing with. You know, when we're dealing with patriarchy, we need to explain to these people that women are not tomatoes. Yeah. Women are not vegetables. Basically, I mean, the, the, the main issue is this is a very patriarchal, it's a very very homophobic at the same time, sexist, you know, culture. And, and, and of course, the government doesn't make things any better, uh, abandoning the Istanbul Convention. And there are all these layers of discrimination and gender inequality that we need to be very much aware of. I am a feminist. I believe feminism is needed urgently, not only in Iran, not only in Turkey, but all across the world. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, you don't look like a tomato and neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that was a hilarious analogy, I thought. I mean, it just seems that even when we women of the East, so-called, are unveiled, you know, like you and me, we just walk around looking like uh, European people, there is an invisible veil sort of wrapped around us. There's this veil of modesty and restriction culturally, of having to pour ourselves into a certain mold, of having to play second fiddle to men, which, of course, doesn't come at all easy to women like you and me. Uh, I mean, we're not exactly shrinking violets. Absolutely. But there is this kind of weight of expectation, isn't there? There's this kind of like trans invisible veil that we have to live with th throughout our lives, even if we're living in the West. And, and you have repeatedly ripped that invisible veil of modesty. I mean, your penultimate novel, 10 Minutes, 38 Seconds, which was nominated for the Booker Prize, is narrated by a dead sex worker whose name is Tequila Leila. Isn't, isn't that right? That is yeah. right. And, and there are transgender characters in your other books. And in your 2017 TED Talk, you mentioned that you were bisexual. And so you've been publicly shamed, condemned, insulted, and subjected to what I would call the Muslim world's very violent and potentially dangerous version of cancel culture. I mean, in those countries, cancel culture, so-called, can be deadly. And so how have you coped with this abuse and these insults and this condemnation? And how can you be a woman of the East and a woman of the West, you know? Um, they're very, very difficult subjects, but I think they're, they're important and we need to talk about them. Um, so I really appreciate the question. Many people, of course, understand that it's not easy to question political taboos in a country like Turkey. But sometimes people don't realize that it can be equally challenging to write about sexuality, to write about um, gender discrimination or issues like, um, you know, incest or child brides. These are the realities that we need to talk about. I mean, I got so much, you know, criticism in Turkey uh, for dealing with these subjects. My books have been investigated. I have been put on trial uh, and, and a lot of abuse, both on social media and media. 
and and it's it's tough i'm not going to claim that it's easy but i also believe that it's important for us to share our stories because you know these are the stories that bring us together and and those untold stories or silences keep you know they keep us apart and they widen and deepen the inequalities um in my work the voices and the stories of minorities always play an important role uh, i sincerely believe as storytellers we don't only chase stories we're equally drawn to silence and to the silenced so i want to put more emphasis on the periphery or people have been pushed to the periphery rather than the center there's a part of me that wants to um bring the periphery to the center you know change that power imbalance and i but in those I, countries yeah. it's it's not like doing it in london or paris i mean it really is something the notion of haram is a very very heavy cloak to wear i don't know how you would translate how would you translate haram I, absolutely haram but also this notion this turkish word that we use a lot ayup yeah, which is, we have that we have that too right yeah. mostly wrong yeah wrong but mostly if not solely used against women in the sense that you know how you sit the length of your skirt whether you wear sleeveless whether you laugh out loud <laughs> the, 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 even yeah. your singing can be ayup singing can be ayup in a place like afghanistan for instance if we we hear this rhetoric coming from islamists so anything you do as a woman uh, is ayup um, surrounded with all those codes uh, it it really breaks my heart if i may share this very quickly with you uh, you know i used to go to schools in turkey a lot to give talks and it gave me a chance um, because i have a children's book out in turkey it gave me a chance to listen to students when you listen to a 6 year old 7 year old in turkey they they're not any different than a 6 year old 7 year old in france in canada or or in america and at that age so many children want to become poets or writers or artists and again at that age girls have so much confidence if not even more confidence than boys right they have so much hutsba and creativity but then if you go and talk to 16 year old 15 year old kids teenagers everything has changed Yeah. Now girls don't want to speak up, you know, because they're worried about being judged by others. Now nobody wants to become a writer or a poet or a novelist anymore. Why? Because we have taught these kids at school in the family in the community just to blend in, don't stand out and especially we have taught our girls um to just, you know, be careful. It's ayup, you know. And so we need to dismantle that rhetoric. But you know dismantling that kind of rhetoric again in Europe or in a western society is pretty easy you know you you go on social media you create some hashtags you make noise you pick it you stand outside you demonstrate etc you shout you scream you go to parliament you know these are par you know parliamentary democracies and places where women's rights have you know advanced hugely i mean they really have but in those in those countries in the countries where where you and i come from These are not really debates that can be led in in the public sphere. I mean, you open your mouth and you're suddenly treated like a harlot. You 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 tr- you're actually you've been called that. You know, you are personally insulted. So, how does one how does one deal with that? Because it it really is you you are up against a dam and um and where do you get the courage to 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 say what you say and write what you write? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's courage, but I I just you know try to do the things that i passionately sincerely believe in you know um and also of course i i do know that having been raised by women i do know that even in very patriarchal acutely patriarchal settings women are not weak women are not victims women are not passive so that gives me hope not only women but also minorities uh, there's for instance an lgbtq plus community in turkey and their stories of resilience resistance it's incredibly inspiring i think we We need to hear these stories. You've said in the past that you don't like identity politics and that you've always been sort of critical of it because you're a global soul with multiple identities and you don't like to be put into one box. And yet as I've discovered in researching my upcoming book Take Down which is all about the politics of contemporary art, the fact that people are recognized on the basis of gender and race has helped put women and non-white artists finally in the spotlight um uh and they've been absent from the spotlight for centuries so there are advantages to identity politics don't you think of course no, no, absolutely um actually what i said was i i like 
um, identity politics as our starting point, but it shouldn't be where we end up, but it has to be our starting point. This is where we need to begin, you know, to talk about race, gender, class in a more intersectional way. This is very close to my heart. And I think it's important to bring all those voices and stories that have been pushed to the periphery into the center. For that, we need to understand our own identity. My point was, we shouldn't only stay in that bay, you know, forever. Once we've started, we need to move further. And our aim should be to go beyond uh, the boxes of identity that are given to us by birth. But it has to be our starting point. It just yeah. it shouldn't be where we end up. It's just the question is, you know, when uh, you, you say it's a good starting point, but then how much identity politics is too much? You know, where there's um, power imbalance, where there's structural, systematic, uh, systemic uh, racism, discrimination, inequality, I think we need to be very much aware of all these walls and barriers of discrimination. And we need to, you know, again, dismantle them. So I'm very much supportive of that. At the same time, I don't want to lose sight of these multitudes that we've been talking about. You know, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that hu as humans, we, we're all much more complex. Um, sometimes, you know, the systems we're living in puts us neatly, pigeonholes us into boxes. For instance, if you're an Afghan woman writer, you're expected to write the stories of Afghan women. Nobody expects you to write avant-garde, experimental, sci-fi or fiction, for instance. Why not? Maybe, you know, she's going to write about Afghan women in a book, but maybe the next book is going to be something else. That's what I'm trying to say. So there are certain freedoms that you are denied if you are regarded as minority or as the other. And we need to be careful about not being trapped in those boxes. Yeah. I mean, are you trapped in a box, Elif, the, the box that says Turkey? I mean, is that a trap for you? It is. A, it has been a very struggle for me throughout, you know, the years. Uh, I'm not going to claim it's easy. I have seen, you know, covers of my books. In the past, it used to happen more often, always with a mosque, always with a women, you know, with a veil, headscarf. Um, I, I write about a broad range of issues, but always, you know, sometimes, not always, but sometimes the publishing world wants to put you in, in inside a neat box. So we need to be careful about that. But there's one more thing I want to share with you. Uh, when I lived in Boston uh, at Mount Holyoke, uh, and it was very cold, I was in the library all the time and all, all the time studying the 60s, 1960s and 70s African American women's movement. It taught me so much. It really uh, was an eye-opening experience. So when you read people like Audre Lorde, there's a big emphasis there on multiplicity. Because at the time, that movement, um, many of them were women, they were on the receiving end of sexism. Uh, and misogyny. Many of them were women of color. They were on the receiving end of, you know, racism. Many of them came from LGBTQ plus communities. So they knew how homophobia worked, for instance. And many of them came from disadvantaged communities. They knew how class hierarchy worked, which is a very difficult subject to talk about. So when they talk about power, they do so in a much more nuanced way than we do today. And when they talk about identity, they do so in a much more pluralistic way than we do today. And in that regard, I think we have so much to learn from, especially 1960s and 70s movement, African-American women's movement. You can, you can, you know, defend uh, or be, care about the identity of your ancestors. But at the same time, just bear in mind that we're all, we all contain multitudes. Are you worried about ever getting cancelled for something you say, because you're very open, you talk very openly about all kinds of different things. And, you know, as you know, authors have been, you know, cancelled or whatever you want to call it, or, or, or condemned or, or trolled or, you know, do you worry about that? I think we should all worry about um, any kind of abuse we can get on social media. There was a United Nations report during this pandemic, which was very alarming. It showed and it was conducted across many countries and it shows that the kind of abuse that women writers, politicians, journalists, women in the public space have been experiencing has escalated during the pandemic. Um, on the other hand, I there are lots of issues that I find very important to this 
discuss. I think we need to become better listeners. Uh, I like to listen to young people, try to understand their anxiety, what they're telling us. I honestly think that there's this almost like a scream building up inside many young people. Many of them feel like we're screwing up the world and it is their world. It is their future. You know, the generations that are making the decisions for them are not really listening to them. So this sense of anxiety is accumulating inside that scream that's accumulating inside many young people. I'm also very much aware of that. And I respect that too. Yeah, but I mean, are you worried that maybe one day you will say something, use a particular word that will then scandalize people and get hordes of people to not like you? I mean, it has happened to to authors recently. Of course. I mean, coming from a country like Turkey, I've experienced, you know, all kinds of social media lynching for all the wrong reasons uh, all the time. And and it bruises you. Uh, We need to create digital spaces and public spaces that are inclusive, that respect diversity of opinions but we need to become better listeners. We need to have nuanced conversations. I think we're living in a world which is bombarded by information, but has very little knowledge and even less wisdom. I am not interested in these snippets of information. We over-romanticize information. You know, you will remember early 2000s, there was this expectation that if you spread around information all around the world, we were going to have liberal democracies. Uh, That was... That prediction was wrong. So my point is rather than focusing on social media and snippets or more sorts of information, how do we increase our knowledge? is what I want to focus on. For knowledge, we need books. We need nuanced conversations. That's why we need cultural spaces, podcasts like this, where we can slow down. We need slow journalism, investigative journalism. And ultimately, hopefully, we need wisdom. For wisdom, we need to bring the mind and the heart together. We need emotional intelligence. So I want to put my energy and my focus more on knowledge and wisdom rather than information. I'm interested in knowing what direction your future novels will take, your future writing will take, especially since there is the weight of expectation for you to always deliver stories about Turkey. Are you, do you think you will always write about stories that are in some way connected to Turkey or that like Milan Kundera, who, when he, when he moved to Paris, you're going to start writing stories about just London. Uh, why not? I mean, it, it could be, you know, both actually, it doesn't even have to be either or. I, I always want to challenge the either or patterns, right? Uh, I believe it's possible to be multiple things. Uh, and, and I might write about London, but again, go back to Turkey in, an, in another novel. We need that kind of fluid world. We need that kind of freedom. This is precisely why we need to challenge the boxes that authors are pushed into. Yeah. Um, since the 2016 coup attempt, Turkey has systematically been arresting writers, journalists, academics. Uh, you've said that it's a major international jailer of journalists. And I guess that makes it difficult for you to contemplate traveling back home. Uh, I just wanted to know how that made you feel and how you felt nowadays uh, in your relationship to, to your homeland. You know, I moved to the UK about 12 years ago and uh, I used to commute a lot between London and Istanbul, but more and more London became home and more and more I found it difficult to travel back to Istanbul. As you know, it's a very difficult environment for writers, journalists, poets, cartoonists, you know, humor has become dangerous in Turkey. Anyone who deals with words, anything you say in an interview, in a poem, in a novel, um, or a tweet or a retweet m- might be enough for the authorities to put you on trial or investigate your work, or, or you can find yourself, you know, um, incarcerated or exiled. So there's always that knowledge at the back of our minds, I think, as Turkish writers, As a result, there's a lot of self-censorship as well, and these are not easy issues to to talk about. Um, But my point is, Turkey has been going backwards, first gradually and then with a bewildering speed. We have seen over the years an increase in nationalism, Islamism, populism and populist authoritarianism. And when and if this happens, we will always see an increase in sexism, homophobia, misogyny, and gender violence, which is exactly what's happening. It is not a coincidence. So it has become a more difficult environment for and so women. So how do you feel about it? I mean, how, how does it make you feel when you think of Turkey? Uh, it's, uh, it's It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart every day. 
Um, but also I try never uh, to lose sight of the fact that there are many people there. There are many young people. There are many women, as we said, minorities who are global souls who want a proper democracy, you know, uh, and, and they also exist. Maybe they don't make the headlines. Maybe we don't hear their voices as much. For instance, the women who demonstrate on the streets, despite the fact that they are treated with tear gas. Can you believe it? In a country where there's so much, you know, an escalating uh, numbers of femicide, where the Istanbul Convention has been abandoned, these women are still there demonstrating. Or people, you know, still go out uh, for Pride March, uh, etc. So their, their courage, their resilience always gives me hope. Uh, that's why when I talk about Turkey, I always feel half pessimistic, uh, but half optimistic. Thank you, Elif. I was just going to come on to the last question. You've achieved a great deal in your lifetime, but I presume that you still have ambitions and dreams that, that remain unrealized, and I wondered what they were. That's a, that's a beautiful question. So many, of course, you know, that's what it means to be human, doesn't it? Um, sometimes when people ask me, you know, what's your favorite book? I, I can never choose. And if I have to, I will always choose the book I'm yet to write, the story I'm, I'm yet to imagine. So writing stories gets me going. Sisterhood, empathy. Um, and like many people, I'm also understanding more and more how important those immaterial things in life are, right? Um, family, friendship, you know, the, the, the bonds that we form as human beings. So, we are, we need to ask ourselves, what do we want in life? Is it more money, more profit, more rush, more, more of all this? Or is this a time for us to do serious rethinking, restructuring and connect, connect with each other as human beings, connect with nature and also connect with ourselves within? That's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you so much, Elif Shafak, for being, as I said, a charming and enchanting guest of this podcast. Uh, it's really been an honor to have you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Thank you to Elif Shafak for joining me on the latest episode of Culture Blast, a series of deep dive interviews with personalities from across the world of culture. If you like this and other episodes, do share the link far and wide and subscribe to the series on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. My special thanks go to the two people who make this podcast possible, the great Karina Pierre Rochard, executive producer of Culture Blast, and the very talented Ben Schmade, the show's producer. I look forward to you joining me for my next conversation.